Well, it's effectively 80 degrees. What can you say? And there's the trajectories. This indicates that the air over Texas has probably originated from that polar outbreak last week. It's a very dry air mass, so it readily heats and cools. And a little bit of loiter time out there in the Gulf or northeast Mexico, some downslope, and that gives us all we need to heat that air mass up. Across the United States this afternoon, a mild polar air mass is spread across the central and northern plains, and that ties into a polar high over the northern Pacific. So we can see that up there in the northwest states, connecting to this Great Plains system across Nebraska. And we've also got this front extending from southern Ontario down through Arkansas and into Texas, where we have north winds, but with very mild conditions behind that front, 50s instead of 20s. The front has not made much headway in the southwestern U.S. It looks like it's tied up up there in southern Utah, but just up to the north in Austin, Winnemucca, Battle Mountain, Reno, winds are out of the north in that region. And we are pumping up the tropical air. We can see that down there in the Gulf Coastal region. We have mid-60s dew points coming up into southeast Texas. That's probably about the highest dew points that I'm seeing. And those 60s extend all the way back towards the Rio Grande region, where we have a triple point around the sanderson Dryden area. If we had a little bit more moisture, a little bit more upper instability especially, this would be a good setup for thunderstorms. But not today. The satellite loops show in a very classic picture of moisture erosion. Instead of building these stratocumulus and cumulus fields in, they're actually dissipating. So we're kind of being taken over by dry air. And we've got this curl up here in the Texarkana area. That's going to be a wave along that frontal boundary. And that's basically what that is right there. So when we pull up the water vapor imagery, you don't really see that low-level moisture. See that dry pocket right there from San Antonio up to Shreveport? Sure doesn't look dry on here. That's 50s and 60s dew points. And that's because this is sensitive mostly to the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. We can't really use this to find low-level moisture. And for that, we have to rely on surface observations as well as model data. A quick check of the 250 millibar chart shows that the U.S. is still under the influence of long wave troughing. This entire region right here is basically a large long wave. And we've got kind of a flat ridge across the central U.S. Descending into that long wave trough is this smaller scale trough that's located from Montana down to California. And upstream, pretty good ridge moving into the British Columbia coast region. And the jet stream is located pretty much like this. But it's a very broad jet. And you can see even down south, picking up over 100 knots. So this could be a subtropical jet in place. And as a result, we're getting these winds above 50 knots everywhere from Miami up to North Dakota. Now we can do a cross-section using a tool at Tropical Tidbits. So let's do that cross-section from North Dakota down to Miami. Well, this is definitely showing some stuff. Tropopause fold right there. Front a little bit hard to pick out, but maybe something like that right there. And the jet pretty much centered right up there in the center of the page. And this is showing the transfer circulation around the jet. There's that descending branch down there. That's going to be roughly over Nebraska and South Dakota. Now when we use these cross sections, it's important to be aware of where the fronts are. So from our surface analysis, we know it's going to be something like that. Let's take a look at a cross section out in the western U.S., say from... Missoula down towards Yuma or Tucson. So there we go. And we can definitely pick out that front. 
You can see the potential temperature lines in green. They become vertical right through that area, and that signifies a front that's hung up in the higher terrain in southern Utah. So that gives some support to our surface analysis. And you can see the stronger winds right over the frontal surface right there. And you can see that the winds are weaker up to the north. Let's take a look at the weather in the southwestern U.S. The water vapor imagery shows very prominent gravity waves. Quite a few of them through there. That's what we tend to get with fast flow aloft. You get a lot of oscillation of the air as it moves horizontally. And it really shows up in this water vapor data. There's those strong winds up there in northern Nevada. Gusting up to 40 miles an hour at Tonopah. Yeah, north wind and 40... You know, I worked at Totopa, so when we see that, that means that there is a front barreling through that area. And down in Vegas, 69 over 3 with calm winds, that's going to be out ahead of the front. So that's telling us that the front is running something like that. And look at that, Sacramento gusting up to 35 miles an hour out of the north-northwest. So that also is going to be the front. In very different conditions down the valley in Fresno, five knot winds at Fresno and pretty quiet down there in Los Angeles so yeah all of this is going to be out ahead of the front so what about the rest of the front well we know that our front is going to be running like that in Utah well yeah there's a wind shift through that area but we've got to focus on the temperatures 60 is pretty warm there at Page so I think that's going to be south of the front so I'm thinking about something like that for the frontal boundary. And out in Colorado, that's going to be a warm southwest wind right there through Santa Fe, out towards Farmington. And as a result, we get an analysis somewhat like that. Now the upper level charts, heights, and vorticity do show a very potent system in northern Nevada. However, this vorticity is channeled the jet stream running something like that, the jet max running right there through the Reno area down to Fallon Naval Air Station. And you can see that going into this evening. Yeah, that's a very strong trough there. And you can see it kind of evolves into a advection lobe coming up on Las Vegas this evening. However, one problem that we have is that there's just not much moisture associated with that system so we don't have the benefit of latent heat look at those precipitable water values down in this quarter inch zone so it's very deprived of moisture so as a result we're probably not going to get much with this except for wind but it will be digging down into Arizona overnight and into New Mexico during the day tomorrow so the question is, does that interact with any moisture? We run that forward through the day, and yeah, a little bit more moisture heading towards it, mostly from West Texas, but it's not quite caught up to that trough. Looks like that may finally catch up sometime overnight Thursday night. Yeah, there's Thursday night, the trough, pretty much a little bowling ball over Midland moves eastward into North Texas during the night and towards northern Louisiana by dawn. And by that point, yeah, it's going to interact with some moisture across North Texas. This is about when that trough is moving over. So I think that could open up some possibilities for precip. So we look at the precip fields. If we don't see precip, we know that there's probably something else going on. If we do see precept, then that confirms our finding. And let's see here. Yep. Warm advection precept pretty much breaking out over North Texas. A lot of embedded stuff. And it gets going late Thursday evening and pushes eastward Friday. So looks like this has picked up some upper air support. And that whole thing will be moving eastward into Alabama during the morning and very quickly into Georgia by afternoon. How's it looking at Storm Prediction Center? 
Yeah, I think they need a little bit of theme music. Yep, they've bumped up the potential to marginal for tomorrow night. They're looking at that shortwave trough that we talked about. Strong isentropic ascent, that's just a word for overrunning. That means we've got a warm front down to the south. Unidirectional flow indicating not much potential for rotating storms. Modest mid-level lapse rates, so it appears we're looking at weak shear and moderate instability. So probably a few hailers in there, but not much else. So returning back to our surface map, taking a look at the southeast U.S. looks pretty quiet over the next couple days, but they will have that thunderstorm cluster heading for them on Friday. There it goes right there. As for today, it looks pretty quiet. We can see southwesterly flow in place, and I'm picking that out because of the smoke. A few forest fires here and there across Alabama and Georgia. And there's the northeast U.S. We saw from the surface analysis low over London, Ontario, with a cold front extending south. And that's certainly a dry cold front. Warm front running about like that. And this is just basically a wave moving very steadily through the strong westerly flow. And it should rapidly exit the area later this evening. And there it is right around the time you're watching this. The only people getting snow, Montreal, Ottawa, and Vermont. And you can see how quickly it moves eastward, and by dawn, it's already in the Canadian Maritimes. But back behind it, some strong cold air advection, so cold weather will return to that area once again. In the north-central U.S., a weak wave moving through that region. That's another feature we saw on the surface chart, running about like that. Now, you would almost miss that surface system, but that's it right there. Going strictly off the pressure lines, you've got a trough right through that region. And when we actually put that together with the thermal analysis, we find a frontal system kind of like that little baby embryonic frontal system moving southeast. And let's see if that's going to come together. Not really. Looks like the anticyclonic flow dissipates the thermal gradients and just not much of it left by tomorrow morning. And that's what we're referring to. This was back around 18Z by the current time. It's already in South Dakota, but that's going to rapidly fall apart. Uh, just a quick look up in the Arctic region. Not much going on up there, but there is cold air in place. Minus 40s across much of the western high Arctic but that's not going to be coming south because the polar vortex is not destined to move southward. And another problem is high pressure to the south, low pressure to the north, so the pressure gradient favors that air remaining locked up in the high Arctic. And then very quickly for the northwest U.S., high pressure covering that area, we can see clear skies in the valleys of eastern Washington. And most of what we see here is just basically snow over the mountains and higher valleys. There's that wave in Nevada that's moving off towards the Four Corners area. And we can see that ridging over the area this evening should keep things pretty nice across Washington and Oregon. Another wave coming in tomorrow, though. That wastes no time moving onshore, so looks like we're back to some bad weather tomorrow morning. And there you can see the conditions deteriorating overnight. Snow across the Canadian islands right there overnight. Looks like some pretty heavy snow in some areas. And that will gradually move into the Seattle area tomorrow morning and inland during the day tomorrow. And that's all for your Wednesday edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you very much for watching and thank you for your support. And if you don't want to be a supporter, head to our website, weathergraphics.com, and pick up some books or software, forecasting tools. It would be very much appreciated. 
Anyway, hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday, and we'll be back tomorrow for the Thursday edition. Have a good one. Bye-bye.